Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to The Rock, and to those who will watch on screen, welcome to you as well. The title of my message today is Elijah in Concealment. Um, I spoke a couple of weeks about, about Elijah, and we were introduced to his life for the first time in 1 Kings 17. We are simply told he's a Tishbite from the land of Gilead, and as we saw two weeks ago, he was a man who confronted King Ahab, a king the Bible who tells us in um, 16 verse 33 that Ahab did more to provoke God, the Lord God of Israel, to anger than all the other kings that had been before him. Um, what an indictment on any person to have that said of them. And how Elijah had come into Ahab's present to declare, as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall be no dew or rain for these years except at my word. Elijah had that confidence, God is alive, God is alive, and I'm his, I'm his representative. And he was also convinced of God's resources. And in James 5, 17, it says, It did not rain for three years and six months. And Elijah was able to do this because he was convinced of God's, God was alive. And we have sung so much this morning declaring God's majesty. And I always love those words. We declare your majesty. We declare that God is our God. And he's above all, over all. And we cannot, we cannot say that God is not there. We cannot say that. God is there regardless of whether we believe it or not. And I want to pick up um, from um, 1 Samuel 17 verse 2 um, to 7. I'm going to read it and then I'm going to refer back to it. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. And it shall be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. For he went and stayed by the brook, brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. And, after, and it happened after a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. The command, verse 2 and 3. The promise, verse 4. 5 and 6 is the response, and verse 7 is the rest. Hide myself? Well, go show myself. Yes, we do that very happily. Hide myself. That's difficult. What would our response be in a largest place? Lord, are you sure you want me to hide myself? After all, there's work to be done. But don't you know the people are dying through lack of knowledge? We need to spread your word. The world is real bad, and the king is the worst. Lord, all those emails I need to answer. Lord, all the prayer requests that have been requested that I need to pray about, the requests for help that I need to answer. Lord, after all, I'm a palace man. So much work to be done. So few, few people to do it. And you want a palace man to hide himself? We don't know the time gap between verse 1 and 2. A difficult assignment in a busy world. Hide yourself when there are so many voices clamoring for your attention that it's so easy to actually miss the voice of God in the process. You may be asking God to use you, to shape you, to mold you, to grow you, to give you a cutting edge. And Lord, where do I go? What do I do? You will have nothing to say to anyone unless you hear from God. You might have something to say, but it's not actually the voice of God. You need to hear from him. What you hear in school, what you hear in conferences, 
what you hear from people, what you read, the radio, the fellowship, one with another, or even in church. Are you hearing God speaking to you? Do you personally know that you are hearing from God? Julian the Apostate, first century, was determined to, bol to blot out every trace of Christianity. But to his embarrassment, the greater the heat on the Christians, the greater the expansion. I learned a new word, thermodynamics. Faith is easy to speak about. It's easy to speak about, and I'm sure all of us could write a book about it. But we have to learn it in life. We have to learn it as we go along our way. And I said today I had a plan to live. If I, as a Christian, sat down in the morning and I said, today I plan to live just a mediocre life. I'm just going to cruise. I'm not going to examine my life in case I find something I don't want to know about. And maybe God will put his finger on it. But you see, that's getting you nowhere. We need to check our lives. A life that is not checked out before God is actually a life not worth living. And asking God to show us, to actually show us ourselves. I can look in the mirror and I can see the gray hair and the lines and the wrinkles and all the rest of it. But do I allow God to look into my heart? Do I allow people to look into my heart? And if they do, what do they see? What do they see? God does not give us a command without providing the tools to work. And if God wants you to go out he, and you, you have heard his voice, he will give you the tools to work. Hide yourself that you may be fed on the word of God. Hide yourself that you may drink from the fountain. Jesus said, if any man thirst, let him come, and I will give him to drink. And the Bible says, you shall drink from the brook, and I will command the ravens to feed you. Simple fare, but sufficient. And sometimes we want too much, because, and we can't cope with it. We have a miracle working God. The book Cherith, he went and stayed there, the Bible he didn't argue with God. You know how often we've got those things, you know, Lord, really, do you want me to go? I don't feel like it today. No, you need to go, no, Lord, you know, it's raining, it's cold, the sun isn't shining, I can't go to church today. He didn't do that. He went at God's command, and he dwelt alone in some obscure, unfrequented place, probably amongst the reeds of the brook. If God calls us to solitude and retirement, hallelujah, it is for us to obey. When we cannot be useful, we must be patient. And when we cannot work for God, we must sit still quietly for him, and he will in turn direct. We needn't, we don't have to go ahead. The ravens came to feed him. Ravens, birds of prey, more likely to have taken the meat from him than to have brought it to him. Ravens are unclean birds. Elijah did not think the meat they brought was unclean. Ravens feed on insects and are eaters of decaying flesh. Yet brought the prophet man's meat and wholesome food. The ravens could only carry a little at a time. And Elijah was thankful that he was fed though not feasted. Ravens neglect their own young and do not feed them. But Elijah ate the food brought by the ravens and gave thanks. Our miracle working God. We don't realize it. We just, the ravens fed him, so that's fine. But when we look at what ravens are, then we start to realize that they are, it's amazing what God has done. And you see, the command was that he would go, which he responded to. And Elijah went and did as God commanded. 
And as I say, do we have an argument with God or we do as God commanded? Do we give God information, thinking God really does not understand the situation? After all, after all, Lord, I'm here and I know what's going on. When Ananias, when God told him, he said, go to the street called Straight. And Ananias said, yes, Lord. And require at the house of Judas. Got that one. And ask for a person called Saul of Tarsus. I don't think Ananias heard anything after that. The Bible tells us that he prayed earnestly. And his prayer, he starts to give God all the information about this man, Saul. Maybe Ananias didn't actually finish his prayer when God said, go thy way. The Bible tells us then that Ananias obeyed and went to the street named Straight to the house of Jonas. And he put his hands on Saul. And you know, I often wonder what was in his heart as he went from when God spoke to him to when he arrived at that house. God must have given him a change of heart. And he said, because he called him Brother Saul. You see, before that, he was still the enemy. He was still the man he didn't want to see. He didn't know whether he was going to have his head separated from his body when he got there. He, he didn't know, and yet God tells, tells him to go and pray. Why must I go and pray for a man that's going to murder me? But Ananias went, and he had that change of heart. Brother Saul, brother Saul, and he could pray for him. And then in verse 7, it comes to pass after a while, the brook dried up. Mm. Lord, you didn't tell me to come and hide myself. Lord, you did tell me. I obeyed you. Didn't you tell me to sit by the brook Cherith, which flows into the river Jordan? Flows, please note, not trickles. Now the brook has dried up. Because there had been no rain, who had prayed <laughs> and asked for no rain? Elijah had prayed it would not rain for three and a half years. How can I be in the center of your will, Lord, and the brook dries up? The power of nature is limited but the power of God is not. God is not so much interested in our knowledge of faith. As I say, I'm sure we could all write books. We could all write a book about it. God is interested in the development of our faith. And you see, if we don't go under pressure, we don't have to have faith. We can just cruise along. God also knows that faith is only developed under pressure. In Mark 4, Jesus presents parables focused on faith. And Jesus is the perfect teacher, but he also knew faith is learnt in love. That same day, when evening was come, the Lord said to them, let us pass over to the other side. And the Bible also says, and there were other little boats there as well. So they go take off across the water, and there rose a great windstorm. And I don't know about you, but this year we seem to have had more wind than any other year. It has blown gales. And we've seen trees blown down. We've seen damage done because of the wind. And here the Bible tells it was a great windstorm had come up. And the waves beat into the boat as it was already, and it was already filling up. And Jesus wasn't in the least bit concerned. He was in the stern. I love that, to sleep on a pillow. I love that. I'm, like, I'm comfortable. And they woke him up saying, teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? Don't you care, Lord, what's going on in my life? Didn't you say it? But you can imagine what they were thinking. At least help us bail out, if nothing else. And they were fishermen who were used to the sea, and they knew the sea. And yet even they were afraid, and even they were scared. They were wanting all the help they can possibly get, even the Lord sleeping very comfortably on the pillow. And Jesus stands up and he rebukes the wind. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Isn't that beautiful? That great, all those waves and all that stress and that, there's a great calm. And when you have a stress and you have something in your life, Jesus comes in, there's that calm. Why are you so fearful? Why are you so fearful? Why are we so fearful with all that's been going on? 
Jesus is there. Jesus is there. He's saying, peace be still. And maybe there's something that's dried up in your life, financial. Maybe it's a physical thing that you are going through or have been for a long time. Maybe it's an intellectual. I don't have that problem. I'm too old. Emotional. Maybe it's an emotional connection with someone that's broken down and you, you're unhappy about it. Maybe it's relationships. Maybe it's spiritual. What happened, Lord? And the Lord's response is, you prayed. You have prayed and asked God to make you anew. And most of us would have got out on the road when that brook dried up and got out our GPSs, got out our road maps, and got out the first person we met. Where is the water? But you see, where's the nearest water hole? We would have started walking. But the Bible tells us Elijah sat and the brook dried up because there had been no rain. Whatever has dried up in your life, sit. God has made provision. And Bible tells us in verse 8, Arise, go to Zerapath, and dwell there. I have commanded a widow these there to provide for you. God commanded Elijah to go. God promised Elijah that he had made provision for him. And you see, Elijah obeyed. And that's the one thing that I've really, in verse 1, where Elijah went into the palace, and here where Elijah responds. And then we have the rest. And you may not think it's a rest when the brook dries up. There may be things in your life I don't know. We all seem to have gone through so much in this last six, I don't know how many months. So much. The brook might have dried up there, but God has made that provision. If we can just remember, God, you have made the provision. You have promised. You have promised that if we're thirsty to go to you, you have promised that you will teach us. You have promised that if we have faith in you, that you are going to, you're going to be there. You're going to command that lady. You're going to command someone to meet that need. And we needn't be afraid. We needn't be scared. We needn't be like that because God has promised. He has commanded us to be there for him. He's promised we respond and we will rest because even if the brook dries up, God has made a way for us.